Thanks very much also to the organizers for the kind invitation. It feels good to be back. Um, my impression after this morning is um, that I'm even more deeply convinced that this is, uh, should be a pan-European discourse. And I'm really glad that you invited me. And um, I would hope for more of my colleagues from the Western countries to follow suit, um, because this would certainly be much more productive um, if we were to talk together. Um, I'll try my best uh, to do so. Is, is the presentation viable? Great, so we need the next slide, please. <laughs> oh, I can do that? That's great. Um, otherwise, I would certainly mess it up. Um, hey, that's good. So that's uh, the title, um, not mine. Uh, the topic given to me, and I'll try to um, deal with that as, as closely as I can. Here's how I would like to, to approach the topic. First of all, kind of a preliminary disclaimer. Um, the reflections that I'm going to offer are probably going to be less determined than what we have heard so far. It's tentative reflections, and I'm not entirely sure about any of these claims. It's more, well, question marks I'd like to, to introduce to you. Second, uh, I was invited to present a German perspective. Um, I'm not entirely sure whether being German already renders the perspective German. I'll reflect on that as I go along, what might be German about that. And finally, I'll try to be Maastricht inspired because this is an event commemorating 30 years of Maastricht. So to some extent, even though I think the issues are really actual and present, pressing right now, um, I'll try to um, refer to the Maastricht elements in that. My talk is going to address basically uh, just the elements of um, the title. Uh, first, the constitutional identity part. Second, the issue of an ever closer union. And finally, uh, the verses, which probably is the most intricate part of that. Um, step one, um, the reflection. Uh, just, just to entertain you in between, I might take the floor <laughs> to comment on two of the earlier things that we've heard, and that might make uh, make some sense to inspire some discussion. Um, my impression was that we heard two lot of very interesting points and two which I thought might be somewhat controversial. Um, one strong plea for a stronger adherence of the European Union to the principle of separation of powers and uh, another plea for a democratization of the European Union. And I was wondering to what extent um, compliance with these demands might actually run counter the other strong demand that we heard today, i.e. decentralized strong member states. At least the German debate, I think, would strongly be based on the idea that the more you align your EU structures with uh, state-like criteria, the more likely you are to end up in a more centralized polity. But just, just a comment on, on what we've heard, um, and quite in line with um, the overall ambition of mine here to underline the intricacies of this endeavor of, of European integration and the many contradictions involved there. And here we are. Uh, just to briefly remind you, we are first going to focus on the first part of the title, that's the constitutional identity part. Um, this is going to be a really German perspective because I'm basically going to answer that from the perspective of German positive law. So that's simple and this also makes me reframe the question a bit because Germans take the liberty, maybe somewhat presumptuously, um, to not answer the question based on European law but on their own constitution and then um, state that it might be in line with European law. So more generally framed the question is are there any constraints um, on European integration? And I've deliberately chosen constraints because it might um, encompass both breaks and limits. And I'll get to that now. Um, basically, it's going to be just a very short excerpt from the very long line of jurisprudence of the German constitutional, Federal Constitutional Court. And it has, in a way, taken three or announced three different limits. I mean, it's somewhat more complex, obviously, but time is short. First of all, and there are two core judgments um, that um, created these still valid 
constraints in the German constitutional system. That's the Maastricht judgment. So here's one of the strong references um, to today's conference theme. Second, the Lisbon judgment. Both of them, basically, the German constitutional court checking whether the respective integrative steps in European integration were in line with the um, German constitution. And you might guess that in both cases, the answer was in the affirmative. The interesting part was in the obiter dicta, as we heard earlier by Peter, um, that it is about the constraints formulated there. Um, constraint number one is that the court said that the EU is not an intergovernmental organization. It's not a federation either. It's a compound of states. And they basically link that to the idea that there is the principle of conferral. The EU may not do anything that has not been authorized by the member states. In German, one of the very, very few German, uh, Germanicisms out there, no competence competence. So no right on part of the central unit to assume new competences. And arguably, I think that's still the predominant view in German legal scholarship. Um, an entity without competence competence is not a federation. That's the core essential element. There are many criteria, but that's the core. So in a way, and I think that's an important message also um, with regard to what I've heard today, Eurofederalists in Germany would have to either change the constitution or convince the constitutional court to change its adjudication on this point, both very unlikely. So federalism is not the vision that is compatible with that. However, of course, we all know there are so many shades in between um, the compound of states and the federation, etc. cetera. Um, the second one, and I think that's also an interesting point to make, um, the court formulated prerequisites pertaining to the EU for further integration to be compatible with the German constitution. And that is meaningful democracy, that's what we heard earlier, right? And so to some extent recently the focus has also been on compliance with the rule of law. So basically, and that was put on um, in the Maastricht Treaty, the most predominant Maastricht decision, the most dominant um, tone in the Maastricht decision was integration can go really far, not beyond the competence, competence thing, but really far, but not yet, and maybe never, because it needs to be a meaningful democracy on the European level. But see if that condition be met, decentralization would really have a hard stand in Germany, right? Um, so, and here is where the court actually put a break, not a limit, on integration. They said, not yet, not too quick, but maybe in some future time. The Lisbon Treaty reframed that, or the Lisbon decision on the Lisbon Treaty reframed that. They didn't speak of any not yet, but they emphasized that there needs to be a retained core of national competences and national domains of sovereignty, so to speak. They were really unclear about what they were, and they seemed to be really lenient about permitting EU core competences, right? Concurrent competences on that. But they at least put away the kind of the break idea and said there's a limit, which couldn't, shouldn't be passed at any time. And that's um, the new idea um, here in the last one, the Lisbon Treaty, and some sacral decision, decisions afterwards. Um, second step, ever closer union. This is not going to be particularly German, um, except that I'm German, that I'm socialized largely, not entirely, um, by German legal scholarship. Um, and some of the concerns, I think, are particularly strong roots in um, German-generated um, concepts and discussions. Um, first thing, or the general question I'd like to, to address is, why should we even consider an ever closer union to be desirable. Why is it integration? This is a dynamic concept in itself, right? And I think it's very important to remind ourselves of the values or the possibly even need for this in order to assess where we should 
want to be the limits. Um, first of all, why is it that they that the EU seems to answer the question for its raison d'etre by reference to some goal. Nation states typically don't do that. They're just there. And they try to create the image of having been there always and being kind of the expression of some primordial community. It's typically fictitious, but powerful fictions workable fictions that are relatively um, strongly rooted in some kind of real narrative out there. The EU doesn't do that. And there are very few nation states um, that would actually point to a goal. Australia is one. The coat of arms of Australia has the kangaroo and the emu because they can only walk forward. If you look at the, um, of the, at the jerseys of the Brazilian soccer team, they have the Ordem et Progress on it. Progress is one of the defining goals of the Brazilian state, but that's the exception. Typically, nation states don't answer the question for their raison d'etre by, by reference to any goal. That's different for the EU, and probably because it's an acknowledgement of its functional justification. It's there only because we need it and to the extent that we need it. And that's why we always talk about the finalité, and that's, because, that's why we have reconsidered finalité over and over again along the long way of the EU. Obviously, this is a speculative observation. It's not a normative statement. It's just meant to be. I don't think it should be such. It's just a speculative, empirical observation about the past. And I'm not sure I'm going to come back to that, whether it's still, still a viable concept for the future. Much more down to earth question, why should we want an ever closer union? There are some areas, just very kind of plain political practicality might call for a platform, a strong viable platform upon which we can address certain policy issues. Kind of the present uh, selection, if you look at the newspapers today, would be climate policy, external security. These are certainly concerns that none of us, none of the member states of the EU would prefer to tackle on the national level. It's there, but it's kind of far from justifying everything that's out there on the EU level. And the third point is the one that I think is the most intricate and the most important one, and maybe one um, that has been around in the discussion for a longer time in those older member states. At least I think that's a very strong one in the German debate. Um, and that's the decreased viability of decentralized policy making due to past steps of integration. It basically says you've taken one step like currency union, the Schengen Agreement, and most basically the common market. And if you don't move on, you'll be in a trap. And the trap is to be explained by the imbalance between what they call negative and positive integration. Negative integration, the idea, and that's a very German debate, Fritz Schaub would be the name that I primarily stick on that one. Um, negative integration is the mechanism of enforcement, of legalistic enforcement of the market freedoms that can either respect diversity, national diversity, or swipe them away because they're not in conformity with the market freedoms. But it can never rebuild them. So depending on how activist the court will be, sooner or later, faster or slower, you'll see a pro process of negative integration occurring, swiping away regulatory policies that used to be there to express preferences of the respective member states um, that run counter this liberal market ideal. That can be consumer policy, social policy, health policy, environmental regulation, what have you. All the kind of regulation that can run counter the market logics. Transfer it to Schengen, open borders require migration policies that are coordinated. 
transfer it to the currency union. How can you have fiscal and economic policies on a decentralized level without coordination if you have a joint currency? So the logic here is you have taken a step. And if you don't take the second step, that is what they call cent positive integration, allow for the central unit to regulate, you'll be left in this trap of incremental, court-driven, slower or faster deregulation. That's the problem. And that's a core problem. And that's, some people call it, the inherent flaw in the DNA of the, of the EU and of the treaties of Rome, that they simply um, set off a machinery that's deregulatory and liberal. You might like that, but if you don't, you're in this trade-off between centralization and accepting deregulation. And that, I think, is the core dilemma that we have to keep in mind when talking about the ambition of a close, ever closer union. Last step, um, the verses. How can we reconcile the two? Some sophistic remarks first and some more serious afterwards. I mean, the conflict is clear. How can you claim to move forward, to program a system, to continuously move in one direction? And it's aggravated if you say there is a limit. And we've just talked in step one about the limits. We all agree there are limits. By the way, it doesn't depend even on the limits. Even if there's just a target, you'll at some point have reached it, even without limits. Even if we, if we could fancy a unitarian Euro European state, at some point we couldn't get the union ever closer. We would be there. So logically, this is somewhat intricate at least, right? But it's aggravated by the fact that we see their limits. Now, the sophistical, uh, the sophistic part. Of course you can imagine that. If you think about asymptotic expansion, think about school and math, you can incrementally approach a goal, come closer to it, ever, ever closer. If your steps get smaller, you'll never reach it. And if you look at the wording, of most of them, many references to this ideal, right? Most of the references come with this idea of the peoples of Europe. There's an S, there's a plural. So it does carry in itself the unattainability of the goal. If it were ever closer, it had to end at some point, right? So sophistic maybe, but probably that's what's in there. But seriously, I don't think that anyone thought of it that way. And I don't think that we should think of it that way. I think last, in the end, it just depends on whether <laughs> the symbolism works. And I think it has worked for a very long time in Europe, for the early years, because there was a widespread consensus that we, put very simplistically, need more of Europe, <laughs> right? And I, here's yet again for step three, the German part of it. I can report to you that Germans do not lead a discussion that is that heated about the ever closer. We have seen that, we don't really care, we realize we are still far from any attainment of this goal, so it's not a hot issue. I realize it's a hot issue here, and for this very reason, I think we have to question whether the symbolism still works, and probably we should drop it, because everybody agrees. In some areas we need some more, in some areas we need less, and emphasizing with this very strong symbolic statement that we're still moving just one direction. That's what we heard this morning. Doesn't seem to, to increase the viability and the legitimacy of this project. Thanks very much.